I'm Julia Resnick from the American Hospital Association. In July 2020, AHA's The Value Initiative partnered with the Advancement League to host a virtual event for emerging health leaders, where we discussed how to create a more equitable path forward from the COVID-19 pandemic. In this video, you'll be hearing from Dr. Uche Blackstock, founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity, as she discusses the health equity implications of COVID-19 and how young leaders can foster change in their communities. Pleasure to introduce Dr. Uche Blackstock. She's the founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity. Um, up until this past December, Dr. Blackstock practiced emergency medicine at the NYU School of Medicine and has been recognized by Forbes as one of 10 diversity and inclusion trailblazers you need to get familiar with. Uh, during COVID-19, Dr. Blackstock has been a fixture on cable news and on social media and recently joined Yahoo News as a medical contributor. And we're just so pleased that you're able to be with us today to kick off this virtual road trip. Thank you for having me. Um, so to get things started, I'd love if you could share with us about your journey and what your path was to get to where you are and what you're doing today. Wow, do we even have time for that? Um, so actually my journey starts with um, something very personal to me. Um, actually my mother, and my mother was a huge influence on me. I am a second generation physician. Uh, my mother uh, was a physician and a huge, huge uh, influence and role model to me. Um, she had a very different upbringing than I did. She grew up in poverty, uh, single mother, five siblings, and had to overcome significant structural barriers to be the first person in her family to go to college. And she was fortunate enough to meet a chemistry professor in college who encouraged her to apply to medical school. She went to all of her medical schools and um, ended up at Harvard Medical School, where I also uh, and my twin sister also went. But the reason why I mention this is because my mom, after all of her education and training, came back to the neighborhood in Brooklyn where she was, where she grew up, and she practiced for many, many years here, um, in, you know, in the same community with the same neighbors. And one thing I learned from her is really about giving back and um, really never really leaving your community. And so when I thought about sort of like the work that I wanted to do, uh, within medicine, so I've been in academic medicine for, for many years. I'm an emergency medicine physician. You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives were always very important to me. The one thing that has stood out to me over the last few years, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, was, you know, racial health inequities. And, you know, I, I've always been, obviously, incredibly um, appalled by them because we're, we're in the richest country in the world with the most advanced technology. And really, despite all of these advances, uh, racial health inequities have been uh, persistent um, all of this time, and we really haven't closed the gap. And I think that what we've seen uh, over the last few months has just really um, uh, affirmed that, that the pandemic has exposed these racial health inequities. Um, and, and just like um, Priya mentioned on those opening slides in terms of who's being uh, infected and who is dying. And so, you know, what is really clear to me is that, you know, in this country, you know, racism, systemic racism has essentially placed uh, black and brown uh, communities, so black, Latinx, and indigenous communities um, at risk for being infected by by limiting job opportunities, by, by limiting home on ownership opportunities. And I think what this also brings into um, play is the idea of social determinants of health and how we really need to uh, encourage, you know, hospitals and all health care healthcare institutions to be very much in tune with how can we address the social determinants of health in order to improve the health of our communities. And so anyway, so I basically started my organization, Advancing Health Equity, over a little uh, over a year and a half ago, and I work with healthcare and related organizations around health equity. And so that means I, I give keynote talks, I also run trainings on bias and racism in medicine, and also how to develop a racial equity culture within healthcare organizations, because, you know, one thing that I notice as a physician is how can we provide equitable care to our patients if the institutions themselves are not equitable? And so, I, and I also provide consulting services as well. So, I what and, and so what this work has done is it's um, really reignited this passion in, in me for for justice. And I think it's not just racial justice, but health justice. I mean, there's something about 
the health of human beings, you know, as being just a basic fundamental right. And so in this moment, obviously, I'm getting a, a lot of work. Um, I'm glad that other organizations, institutions uh, are as concerned about racial health inequities as I am. But we do have a lot of work to do to close that gap. Yeah, and it really seems like over the past few months, like the, the mainstream discourse has become more aware of racial health inequities than ever before, um, whether that's because of COVID or because of all of the Black Lives Matter protests that we've been seeing across the country. Right. So given your expertise, you are the perfect person to ask really like what's next? Where do we go from here to take this awareness into really doing something and making it? Yeah. Change? And what I mean, does that forward look like? Yeah, no, I feel like, and I'm sure other people feel like this, and maybe because I'm a little bit of an optimist, I do feel like we are at this inflection point, right? We're having these conversations that we that we haven't had before. Um, and so, you know, I, I testified actually in front of the select, the select subcommittee on the coronavirus um, in front of the U.S. House of Representatives, well, virtually um, in early June. Uh, but some of the recommendations that I gave them really are, are around um, policy. So, you know, ensuring that every American has health insurance. And so I think that, you know, I personally advocate for um, a, a, you know, a single-payer universal health coverage for everyone is that looks like, you know, extending Medicaid, Medicaid um, ensuring health care protections, especially for essential um, and service workers. I think we need to re you know, reinvest in our public health infrastructure. We've seen over these last few months what happens when, when an administration dismantles um, you know, the public health infrastructure. And I think also, ultimately down the line, we need to uh, funnel funds and resources to black and brown communities and to allow for opportunities for home ownership. That's the only way that people can, one of the ways that people can develop well. Uh, and, and we know that that's directly tied to health outcomes. We need to have adequate and safe housing. Uh, people need opportunities for gainful employment with benefits and sick leave. And then also quality education. We see what's going on right now with the pandemic in terms of schools reopening, and we're seeing how much um, how much schools have become a safety net for black and brown children, right? And so, you know, I, you know, I think that, you know, we need to really commit the funds, the time, and the effort to ensuring that these communities are not just healthy physically, but, you know, socio-emotionally and have opportunities. And do you see this happening more at the federal level, or is this like a local and state? No, I, I feel, yeah, I feel it's both. I think it's at the, it's at the federal level. Um, there needs to be a commitment at the federal level, absolutely. But I think, you know, each state is going to do it differently, and it may, and it may look differently because there are different needs um, in terms of the communities that are represented. Uh, but I think now is the time. If not now, then when? Absolutely. Um, so certainly there are a lot of things that need to change. You listed a bunch of them. Um, to have a more just and equitable society. But what do you see as, like, the priorities or must-haves or preconditions for us to really make progress. On yeah, that. yeah, and so I think that you know, like in, in this moment, under everyone understanding and coming to sort of agreement on on the, how the ills of racism and and what um, what race systemic racism has has done in terms of the history. One is understanding the history. How did we get here, right? How do we get to a point where we're seeing these appalling racial health disparities in the pandemic? where we're seeing, you know, a black man on camera being brutally murdered by a police officer. Like, it had to take that for, I think, a lot of Americans to, to wake up, right? And so we really need to interrogate the institutions, healthcare system, educational system, uh, legal system, all the, these systems that essentially have racism embedded in them. We need to look at practices and policies that disadvantage some groups over others. And we need to have a very... Um, intentional approach to it. Uh, otherwise, we'll find ourselves in the same situation that we're in now, you know, 10, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. And we know that history does have a tendency to repeat itself. And I think, I think it's our responsibility as young leaders who are in the health field um, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, yeah, because I think that I, I think that all of us would agree that we want all of our patients to to receive the best care possible, right? But that's just not happening. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and we also know that so much of health comes from outside of 
clinical. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, that, and I think that is also a fundamental understanding that everyone needs to have. That it's not just health is not just me um, treating my patient, right? Health is making sure that you have access to healthy foods, right, or that you have green space in your neighborhood to exercise, or even that you feel safe enough to exercise in your neighborhood. So we really have to think, have a more broader understanding of how social and economic policies, how um, how structural racism, how economic systems impact the way that people work, live, and play um, in order mm-hmm. to make sure that they can achieve the best health outcomes possible. Yeah, and given that there are so many factors that contribute contribute to health, what do you see as the role of like hospitals in the healthcare system in getting Oh, yeah. <laughs> so absolutely. I think healthcare institutions and hospitals should be the ones leading the way. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, I think every hospital or healthcare institution should have an office of community engagement. Like that should be a must, right? You need to center the communities that you serve. You need to be aware of what the needs, concerns, and priorities are of community members. And community members need to be on the board. They need to be involved in making um, really critical decisions about the, about the hospital. And then hospitals need to be um, not just involved in clinical care, but working with community-based organizations that are already doing work on the ground, that are led by trusted leaders, um, and I think that's really going where we're going to make the biggest impact. Great. Um, and so we have a lot of smart and energized emerging leaders who are on this call, and I think we're all trying to figure out how we make the greatest impact with our careers um, and on our organizations and our communities. So what's your advice for all of us? Yeah. So, so what's interesting is that I never thought that I would have my own organization. I thought I would stay in academic medicine all of my life. but. What I did was I followed my values and I followed my purpose. And I think there's, I think there's this phrase that, you know, when you walk in your purpose, you find your destiny. So I think you always, you stick, you stick to your values, you stick to what's important for you and what you believe in and find work that aligns with, with that as well. That is great advice. Um, so that was the last question I had prepared. I know, I'm, I'm sure that as people are listening, they might have questions for you. Um, so if any of those come up, um, please put them in the chat box. Looks like we've got some people typing away. How was your experience testifying in front of Congress? I know I was watching that. <laughs> oh, that was really interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't realize, like, honestly, how performative it was. Um, I, I, and what I realized also is the staffers really are the ones that have the biggest sway and the biggest influence on um, our Congress people. And, 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 you know, there are a lot of very young, smart people. And so really those are the ones that you can get in the ears of if you really want to, to influence legislation. So young people are the key is what you're saying. Oh, always. <laughs> Perfect. And we have a question from Vikas Chowdhury from PCCI. Um, can you give us some examples of communities that are moving in the right direction for health equity and what specifically they're getting right and what we can learn? It's a great question, Vikas. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I've been working with some, um, you know, community-based organizations, and, you know, some of them are, like, developing sort of integrated um, care facilities where um, the community can not just doesn't just get preventive care, but also mental health um, and other social services. And so, you know, I think that integrated care model is, is going to be very, very important because it really is a more holistic way of treating community members. Mm-hmm. Um, and from Derek Boyd, how can social determinants of health programs better address systemic racism? Yeah, I, mean, I think that these programs need to, re- to really understand what a key driving force racism is. Um, in the social determinants of health. Um, I would say that um, there are really, a lot of really great racial equity tools out there, like there is the Government uh, Alliance Racial Equity Tool, the GARE tool. Um, and so when you're developing practices and policies, it's a great tool to use to ensure that you have clear and measurable outcomes, that you're thinking about how certain communities can be advantaged or disadvantaged by decisions made, and to make sure that when you're implementing certain practices and policies that you're using a racial equity lens. And so there's a lot of great um, toolkits out there that I think organizations really should use if they want to be intentional about achieving health equity. Mm-hmm. I think that intention is really key. Yeah. Um, so 
Jose Garcia is asking, what concrete steps can organizations take to ensure that one, health equity, health equity in communities, and as well as have diverse individuals in senior leadership roles, not only in middle management? Yeah, I know that's, no, again, so I think that it needs to start with the leadership, right? We need to have people in leadership who are concerned about um, about race and racism, They're, and, and concerned about about health equity. Um, I'm actually uh, inter- I'm, part of my consulting work is working with organizations around ensuring that the leaders that they hire have some competency in racial equity and inclusion skills. And so I think that's going to be something that we need to start looking at. Like, not only is someone great at running an organization, but they're also great at paying attention to. They also have this other skill set that's important, and then that just sort of trickles down on the entire organization. Mm-hmm. And I think that flows really nicely into the next question about how we can address systemic racism at different points in a clinician's career, including such training. A, yeah, such a, yeah, such a great question because I think what we've seen now, and you know, I'm even thinking about my own medical school education. There's so much that I did not learn in medical school that I learned as a practicing physician. Um, and so, again, the young people are the ones that are you know, putting the fire under our feet. I know that in a lot of medical schools there is a, um, you know, there's a, a change to make sure that our, our curriculums include um, information about the history of racism in healthcare, you know, um, talking about bias and, and racism in healthcare, and sort of being more, you know, we talk about being more intentional about it. Um, but again, like, like I said before, I think that we have to think about how the institutions themselves function to perpetuate racism, right? Thinking about how we use even exams like, you know, like the NCAT, standardized tests. We know standardized tests are not really a great way to, to choose people to be doctors. We are, you know, full human beings. One, you know, a test shouldn't determine that. So we really need to think about everything from recruitment, you know, retention, mm-hmm even for faculty, for promotion, you know, think about the sort of that whole continuum um, if we want to, you know, you know address you know, racism in medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so what are your thoughts on regarding patient health care literacy or literacy in general um, impacting their understanding of the delivery of care? Um, are there policy changes that can happen to improve this? Yeah, and oh, that's a great, oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, what, one area that I have a personal interest in is like the community health workers. I, I feel like they are very, un, and I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post recently about this. I feel like they are very underutilized workforce, and I think, you know, they usually are trusted individuals from the community, and I think this is an area in terms of healthcare literacy where um, they can be incredibly invaluable, especially in terms of, even in the pandemic, instead of, in terms of spreading information and education about, you know, coronavirus transmission and symptoms and how do you stay safe. So that's definitely something that I, I, that I support and advocate for. Wonderful. Well, we are just about out of time, but I want to thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Blackstock. Oh, thanks um, for having me. It's such a pleasure, um, and thank you for really kicking us off with your inspiring remarks. Um, thank you. I'm now going to turn it over to Priya for our next okay. speaker. Thanks okay. so much.